hear about a housing crisis, uh, particularly for renters uh, who've just been bled dry in, in a lot of places to pay for their housing. Our guest says this is not a crisis. The housing market is working exactly as it was meant to, uh, enriching property owners at the expense of everybody else. We are joined by Ricardo Tranjan, senior researcher at the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives. Ricardo, thanks very much indeed. So government after government has put through policies aiding homeowners. I, I guess in particular, I'm thinking about the capital gains. It's, it's tax-free when you flip your principal residence. Yes, there is a number of policies that are put in place, usually to um, help folks to access home ownership. Where it's not necessarily a bad idea to do those, those things, the way they're usually done is through uh, incentives to indebt themselves even more. And, and that has helped overall to create a bubble in the market. And we have seen a lot less policies, especially at the federal level, but also the provincial level, that would directly support those who are renting and who may not be uh, able to access home ownership anytime soon. You think that it's time to politicize this in the sense that renters should realize they're getting the rough end of the stick and, and vote accordingly? Yes, absolutely. I think we, we spend a lot of time focusing on what would you know take to get more people into home ownership and, and again that's a good conversation to be had but according to my estimates about 70 percent of the population that presently rents uh, will not have enough income uh, over the next few years or over the next little while quite some time actually some in some cases to access home ownership neither will have uh, access to subsidized housing or non-market housing uh, because those are really hard to access because we haven't you know we haven't been building those kinds of housings for quite some time now so that 70 percent it's kind of in the middle and what would really actually have an impact on their um, everyday financial security and their housing security is to have a, a better regulated a better supported rental market instead but we we rarely talk about about this. You say that the industry, the housing industry, um, is, many of them are quite happy with the status quo, but we often hear we need more supply, more supply, but you think it's not that simple? Yeah, supply is necessary, but it's not sufficient. What I think that uh, when we emphasize too much supply, what we do is that we would depoliticize the debate. Because when we talk about simply supply and demand, everything seems quite simple and quite mechanical, right? If we add supply, prices will stabilize. If we add people, prices will go up. And the, if the conversation stays there, you know, what is the answer then? Let's build more. We build more and prices still don't stabilize. We build more, prices don't stabilize. And then we hear the real estate industry say, well, we don't have enough incentives. We don't have enough uh, uh, subsidies. There's too much regulation. So if you move all the regulations out of, the, out of our way and you provide us more subsidies, more incentives, we can build even more. So it, it, it kind of, at some point, you have to call them on it and say, it's a very disingenuous argument. It's a self-serving argument. We need to build more, but what kind of house we're building, whether we regulate it or not, uh, where we build it, those things matter as well. But when we talk about that, we have to bring politics into the back into the conversation, which not everyone wants to. I'm, I'm, you reckon that governments have just turned their back on their responsibility to build uh, affordable rental housing? We have, we have. Uh, so, but it's been a long time uh, since the 1990s. We government sort of stepped away from from directly supporting and building non-market housing. Uh, in recent years, in 2015, uh, the new federal government uh, talked about you know coming back into housing, the development national housing strategy that was approved in 2017. There was a lot of hope among policy folks like myself, researchers and housing advocates. Um, but eventually we realize that the federal government it's only predominantly providing incentives to the to, to private developers to build more housing and then expecting a, sh a small share of that housing to be maybe 20 percent below market prices uh for 
10 to 20 years. So that hasn't really moved the needle on affordability at all. Uh, we had expected if the government's going to come back into the housing business, it really come back in and in bring the sort of the financing and building capacity that we saw in the 1960s and we saw in 1970s, would bring back the kind of resolve that we saw when the pandemic hit and we needed governments to be there and do something. But it hasn't. It has been a quite timid role so far. Yeah, I'm trying to think. I, I remember a guy in the housing market telling me, or involved in the housing market, telling me years ago that it used to be life insurance companies, big investors, would buy apartment blocks uh, as a long-term asset. But then the building industry realized, why would we sell to professionals like that? Let's build condos and sell to the public and earn a full retail margin. Yes, absolutely. That has been part of the of, of the problem. Like we, when we stop building purpose-built uh, apartment buildings that are you know meant to be rental housing and that is meant to be professionally managed with a long-term sort of horizon uh, for for the business and for the financial stability of the business, uh, we we stop doing that and we build more condos. And condos, a large share of them are used as uh, investment properties. In Toronto, uh, about 40% of all condos are investment properties. And what changes that is that the investors, sometimes there's often they're like small investors, individual investors, uh, but they have a much more aggressive approach to it. Uh, they put some pay, down payment down, and now they expect the rents to cover all of the operating costs, uh, maybe make even some you know money on the day-to-day, -day, and in the end, earn some money on, 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 the, on the selling of the asset, some on their capital investment, right? They're quite aggressive. Uh, often we hear that they're losing money because of the high interest rates. And by that, they just mean that they're not breaking even, even though like the property in the asset is increasing, but that for them is not enough. They want to like, you know, have their cake and eat it too. Um, so yeah, it, it has been part of the problem that the, the shift on focus, the shift on uh, to, to, to condo development as opposed to uh, purpose built uh, apartment buildings. Is there a role for housing co-ops, uh, people getting together to, to build accommodation or other models, not just government owned and not just privately owned, but a kind of halfway house? Absolutely. When we talk about non-market housing, which is a term that we use today um, to refer to all housing, essentially, that the main motive behind it is not profit, it's really housing security. And that's where we have to sort of differentiate here. Markets, private developers, private landlords, they're in it for the business of it. Mm -hmm. And the business is to get some margins of profit, uh, to have returns on investment. It's not part of the business model, or is it maybe shouldn't even be a demand that we put on them to generate housing security. That's not mar what markets do. Uh, so that's why we say we need a larger share of the housing stock to be non-market housing. So you move, remove that profit motive, and you say, what are we trying to do here is to house people at an affordable rate. But when we get there, there is a number of models that you can use, right? It doesn't need to be always government managed. It doesn't need to be government owned. Uh, governments usually play a, an active role in, in getting started and providing subsidies, providing support. It's really hard for a group of people just to, and some have, but it, sure. it's really hard for people just to pull it off by an co-op. But there are a lot of models, and there are lots, lots of expertise on, on what's the best model, when and where, and, and that we can tap on. It's kind of interesting. I mean, in some ways, uh, a condo is a co-op owned pro um, property, isn't it? I mean, the, the unit owners in the building all get together to manage it. Um, yes, um, in a way, but they're still considered individually owned properties, yes. right? Uh, whereas the, the 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 like the freeholds, each one of them, and each one of them has the right to sell it, the unit, and just kind of you know, walk away, uh, which in a co-op you couldn't do, right? It's the entire asset. It's co-owned and co-managed by everyone there. No one gets to sell a piece of it.